I've been passionate about music since I was probably five or six years old. I thought, who's Brad Hudson? I interviewed David Bowie, you know, I interviewed David Byrne, you know, lots of really interesting artists. I just went out of my way to make sure that happened. I had to find the enemy. Now I'm dealing with the monster. You know? <laughs> All too often, businesses don't actually believe in the product that they're pushing. They were also incredibly ruthless. I knew I wasn't a kind of alpha male type person. I was not qualified. That was a crisis. That, that could have sunk the business. And MTV wrote to me. When I arrived in London, they said, Brent, a huge welcome to the Lead On Purpose podcast. Thank you very much. I'm so glad to get a chance to sit down and finally do this. Yeah, yeah, excellent. And I think for the listener, I should uh -huh. probably tell them, you and I have known each other for, I think it's just over 15 years. Yeah. And the reason being is our shared affinity for Scottish culture and music, yes. specifically the pipe band. Correct. Seems like a rather arcane way of getting to know somebody, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, I joined a pipe band at school. Uh, I went to a school here in Christchurch, and I joined the band as a way of getting out of mil military training. <laughs> so it was really like a default. So I sat in the band room and listened to Jimi Hendrix during the day, <laughs> and at the end of the day, put the kilt on and we played the flag up and down my got out of military training. So, so good. So mine was sort of through the back door, I guess. <laughs> well, I kind of, mine was somewhat similar. I got into trouble at school and my way out of trouble was through ah, drumming. Discipline. Yeah, 100%. Uh -huh. And that's what really did connect because I remember sitting in Christchurch, which is a 12,000 miles from my home, mm -hmm. and hearing about Brent Hansen. And the reason I heard about you was at this school they had a cup named after you. Uh -huh. and it was a drumming cup. Uh -huh. And if you were a, you know, a successful drummer and committed, you would get awarded the Brent Hansen Cup. So I thought, who's Brent Hansen? Mm. So I started asking around and starting research. I was like, wow, Brent sounds very interesting. I need to reach out to Brent. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think we met uh, 2006, 2007, and started talking about our shared love for pipe bands, but also music. Yeah. And what really blew me away was what you were doing and what you had yeah. done yeah. in the music scene. Yeah, well, music... I mean, first and foremost, I'm a music fan. Mm -hmm. uh, before you, know, you talk about business or leadership or any of those things, it's uh, an incredible interest in music. And it's been, I've been passionate about music since I was probably five or six years old. I used to sit at night in bed with a little transistor underneath my pillow and listen to the ZB network, which in those days wasn't a right-wing uh, radio station. <laughs> it was actually a popular music station. And great music was on music in the radio in New Zealand when I was a child. And I could hear the birds, and I could hear you know, Hendrix, and I could hear all this incredible music that was actually on the charts. And so I developed a, a passion very early on. And I always believed that I would somehow make a career in music. Not necessarily as a musician, though, who wouldn't want to be you know, a popular musician, but actually in the music industry. And so I just went out of my way to make sure that happened. And I just focused and focused on it. And I always believed that someone would see my my uh, intense you know, interest and my enthusiasm and passion for music and it would somehow work to my advantage somewhere along the line. I always had that belief. Isn't that so interesting that when you say that, I hear a couple of things. One, you had a real clear vision. Mm -hmm. I want to make a living out of music. Yeah. I want to be involved in that. That's what I cared about. And I can see it. You mm -hmm. still have that. Oh yeah. It's I'm not still, I'm 67 years old. I'm still going to a couple of gigs a night in London. You know, uh, a week, should I say, rather than a night. But uh, you know, I will, I will go out and participate and be part of that world. I'm still, and still as excited as I was when I was a 12-year-old buying my first vinyl albums. It's amazing. And that belief is a big part. You, you mentioned that a moment ago. You, just, you had belief that if you showed up with passion, people yeah. would believe in you and give you the opportunity. Yeah. I think that's a really overlooked part of, you know, in business is an actual you know, belief in what the core product that you're dealing with is. Not just about the making of the money or the remuneration that you get as a chief executive or salesperson, but to actually you know, deeply believe in what the product's about. And actually, and not in a cynical way, not rote learned, but actually living it. Being credible, being a part of it. And that's the thing that we see you know, all too often businesses don't actually believe in the product that they're pushing. You know, we look at some of the fast food chains, for example, they know that that stuff's not doing any good. Right. Right. And I think that in leadership, we need more people who believe in themselves, believe yeah. in their product. Yes. Oh, well, I guess it's true. Although I did work for a rather large corporate and there were plenty of people who think that that wasn't doing positive things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I believed it was. 
but I mean, there are plenty of people who might feel the same way about a fast food chain in terms of uh, its reach and its you know monopoly in many ways and for for many years. So yeah, I think there's a bit of uh, there's a bit of both, but I think that you know hiring people to run businesses because they can bring the numbers in, you know, only works to a certain degree. If some if you can actually live and be an exemplar of what that product's about, then I think that's you know, not in an unnatural way, but in a natural you know, um, concerted, you know, enthusiastic way. I think that makes, I mean, that's half the, half the game. 100%. And in terms of, let's say, if we go back to your upbringing in New Zealand, yeah. I think somewhat that is an advantage in terms of shaping the lens that you look at the world well, yeah. through. Well, definitely. Right? So tell me a bit about that upbringing. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, actually, because I mean, anyone young watching this podcast now or listening to it will recognise that, you know, that there are so many parts of what my upbringing was, which, which didn't, things that didn't exist when I was a child. I mean, there was no internet. <laughs> you know, you, you know your, in, your world view was shaped by school and the, and the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> you know, and if you were interested, like I was in popular music, then I actually had to go out and find that. I had to find the NME, and I had to find Rolling Stone, you know, and I had to listen to stuff, and I had to buy it. I literally had to buy every single thing that I listened to because most of the stuff I listened to wasn't going to be on the radio once I developed a taste. So you, that's an investment mm-hmm. yeah, as, a, as, a, as a child. So uh, it's quite different to just Googling something, you know, finding out where it is, getting the information, downloading it, or you're just streaming it, never owning it, never having an emotional connection. I had an emotional connection quite a lot so, with music. So that was a great thing in New Zealand. We're at the bottom of the world, you know, and, and we're a long way away from the rest of the world but very influenced by the United Kingdom when I was a child, and also by the United States. And that's the, really the two pillars of you know, international you know, pop, popular rock, rock-based music. 100%. Mm. And if we think of that, so you, you had this passion for music. Mm-hmm. You ended up going to this school that had a pipe band that got mm. you out of military service, but mm-hmm. you got to enjoy the Scottish music, mm. which is very much requires a lot of discipline, mm-hmm. focus, mm-hmm. passion, commitment. Mm-hmm. Well, it was, it was kind of a joke. Right. When I was at school, I mean, when I was, at, yeah, the band was sort of like, why would you do that? Well, because of this incredible Celtic, you know, this Celtic world that I, was opened up to me, that, which is another part of it. Is that I'm a pop, rock kind of music person, but I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm, also, I'm interested in, you know, Steve Reich. And I'm interested in, you know, some, you know, lots of classical music. I'm interested in Celtic music. I'm interested in bluegrass. I'm interested lots of stuff. And that started with, with Scottish music. Yeah. Because I, I learned that there was this incredible other world that was never going to be part of my mainstream, but which was so soulful, you know, and was able to you know, emotionally enhance what I was doing. So that was that's the beginning of a path of taking, playing it wide. And I love that. Yeah. And I think that's so many people want to become specialists yeah. at a very young age and are trained to do so. Yeah. You know, become the mathematician and the physician yeah. and go to university and get this and become sure. a doctor. I love that you had this broader perspective. Mm-hmm. And that actually bagpipes and drums played a part in that for you. Definitely. That's huge. Definitely. Now, what happened then, Brent, from being in Christchurch, New Zealand, and then starting to think about, okay, where am I taking from school to profession? What was the bridge there? Hmm. Well, I was quite good at school. And, you know, well, obviously I was going to go to university. Uh, I went to Otago University and I did a, a, you know, a double major degree in English and history. Then I did a master's degree in uh, English literature, including Old English. You know, so quite reasonably arcane end of the market. And I figured I was going to be a school teacher. Wow. So I, I thought that that was, you know, that was the path. I didn't particularly, at those, in those days, wanted to be a journalist. Uh, I didn't think of business as being something I could be part of. So I, you know, I thought I'd be a teacher. So I, I, I took a teaching bursary, and I spent a year after my master's degree training to be a school teacher. During that time, I was writing music reviews for a, a little tiny newspaper here in Christchurch, just like a handout. Um, those reviews were read by somebody at Television New Zealand, it was called South Pacific in those days. Uh, and they said to me, would you be interested in doing some work with us? We've got Graham Parker and The Rumour are coming to tour and we need someone who doesn't work for TVNZ and who uh, but he's interested in music and who, so the, the, who can in, you know, sort of be our interpreter, I guess, between the, the band and us recording a concert. So my job is to put the headphones on 
and I had to talk to Graham Parker and to his manager and and I just you know and then the guys after that they said to me well you know perhaps you know don't if you don't want to go teaching you know we're also the public service we'll pay you the same amount of money as you would have been got paid for teaching so why don't you come you have to start as a floor sweeper but why don't you come and learn you know about you know about television and I thought to myself you know what if I was going to be a great school teacher some experience of the world outside of academia before I went into teaching wouldn't do me any harm. Mm -hmm. So I gave myself a goal. I gave myself a goal that within three years I would have to feel that I, I either wanted to stay in television or I would go back to teaching. Mm -hmm. So I, and I started, and, and it was something I was really good at doing. As I was a floor manager and my job was with the guy in the studio with the headphones on who would cue the talent had to organise the studio, which sort of represented the crew, the cameramen, all the different people there, and interpreted it to the to the talent and also to the director. And that, so, in a way, that was a beginning of a sort of an enforced chain of command leadership. They gave. I had to take responsibility. I had to stand up on a stage in front of a crowd of people before a live broadcast and explain to them what was going to happen in the clear, you know, you know, layman's terms. So I had to do that. And then one day. This guy knocked on the door of Television New Zealand and he said to the receptionist, I'm a famous record producer and I come from Christchurch. Is anybody interested in, in interviewing me? Wow. And they called me up as the rock and roll guy at TVNZ and, and, in, in Christchurch and said, there's this guy called Richard Burgess here. Uh, you know, he says, you know, he says he'd like to do an interview. Do you know who he is? I said, I know exactly who he is. He was in the Quincy Conserve in Wellington, and then he went over and he played for Chirone on that, you know, on Supernature and all that sort of Italian disco stuff. Wow. He was in a band called Landscape that sang Einstein and Gogo, and he produced Spandau Ballet. So, so, okay, so so I rang rang Ready with Pictures, which was the cool music program which used to be on a Sunday night, which played live concert footage, music videos, and I called them up and said. Hey, this guy's here in town. Are you interested, guys interested in sending a crew down to do an interview with him? You know, it, it's right in your sweet spot. And they said, you know what, you do the interview. So I, I went to a hairdressing salon and I got, got them to allow us some time and I interviewed him in the hairdressing salon. And the next minute I got a phone call saying, leave your job, come up, you're still working for TVNZ but you're going to be a director. You're going to direct radio with pictures. Wow. So. I mean, it couldn't have been any better. Landed on your lap by just it on my lap. seeking opportunities. Yep. And, and it's one of the two jobs I ever had in my entire career. So I went to Wellington and I, I initially directed the studio broadcast, but then I did lots of interviews. I interviewed David Bowie, you know, I interviewed David Byrne, uh, you know, lots of really interesting artists, you know, made music videos. Uh, directed, you know, 28 camera outside broadcasts for telethons, and suddenly I was in a whole different world. Another set of responsibilities, but also completely in my sweet spot. This program was a cool program, you know, and it wasn't pop music, it was for the music heads. And it was on a Sunday night and it ran into the Sunday horror. And so the Sunday horror always had to end at a certain time. So they would tell us each week how long the program could be, because it had to fit between the format of the programs and the Sunday horror. So sometimes we had 45 minutes, sometimes we had an hour and a half. So you had to be pretty flexible. So I learned a lot of skills between learning how to wind up a cable in a studio so it didn't unfurl badly, how to cue people in on the, stu in the studio floor, how to write a television script, how to work things out bang on duration, and most of all, how to make editorial decisions that were, would actually be good enough for a national broadcaster to put a program out. So, that, so that's kind of what, what happened to me. And then one day, Television New Zealand said, we're taking your program off air because we're having a dispute between the VPL, which was the uh, Video Play Limited, which was a group of uh, a, an organization controlled by the record companies, which had a cost that they accept, expected a broadcaster to pay for every music video. And they, TVNZ had said, no, we actually feel it's a promotional tool. So you should be paying us. Or if not, then we should be. We should have a quid pro quo. So the dispute got pretty wild. So they decided to take our program off air. During my time at Radio with Pictures, David Bowie, Talking Heads, 
Paul Simon, we're talking a long time ago now, but you know, these artists started to look better on the other program we made, which was called Ready to Roll, which was a top 20 pop show, because of the music videos. And I realised what it was, it was this company called MTV. And MTV had come up with a format, which was making what we did for 45 minutes on a Sunday night, turning that into a 24-hour lifestyle channel. So I wrote to them and said, like, I'm going to be living in London for six months on sabbatical. So we decided, my wife just got married. My wife and I decided we were going to go to, go to, see, go to Britain, come back to New York, see MTV if we can, if they would let me come in, and then, uh, and then, and then come back home and take up where we were before. Uh, and MTV wrote to me. When I arrived in London, they said, of course, you can come through New York, but we're about to launch the first international channel outside of America. And we think you, you've got an interesting CV. Wow. Because I mean, I had a lot of experience. I was 30 years old, but I had a lot of experience. And much more than anyone in Britain would have had at that stage through, because you, know, you would have been much more siloed. So I was, a, I was an everyman, you know, kind of television executive. So, so they said to me, well, well, we'd like to hire you as a, as a director you know, in the news team. So I, I'm not sure I want to work there, I thought to myself, because I thought, you know, it's sort of kind of like the enemy. I'm, I'm part of the kind of credible end of the market, <laughs> and now I'm dealing with the monster. You know? <laughs> then, then I thought, but you know what? It'll pay for my combi van to my trip around Europe, and I'll, I'll have some experience. I started, and I realized I was working, working for an American company. It was in, incredible, and I've ne I will never forget this. I realized that working for a, a big American corporate, they're a glass half full of people, mm -hmm. very optimistic. You've got potential. Show us what you can do. Going to any of the British companies that I, while well, I was there for that time, just seeing whether there were any jobs going, you can't be any good. You proved to me that you are. Mm -hmm. So the American thing was much more optimistic. However, they were also incredibly ruthless. So once we we're underway and we were we were launched and it was this incredible, you know, using English as a sort of second language, broadcasting across Europe, what actually started to happen was. People weren't up to scratch because uh, you know Americans also have incredible work ethic, and people just weren't work used to working like that. So people getting were getting fired, and I just kept getting promoted. So within six months, I'd gone from director in the news team to you know head of news to head of production to executive uh, to to pro head of programming. So within six months, I was programming the entire television channel purely because I was mature, confident, and not arrogant, and I spoke English, but I wasn't English and I wasn't American. Very helpful. So at that stage, I thought, wow, I mean, I'm not going back to New Zealand. I'm going to, I have to ride this out. <laughs> and within not that long period of time, I went from being that person to being the president of the company because they realized that, it was, that what was most valuable for, for the company as an American expat television channel was that you know, somebody who was credible, was a music fan, who could talk the talk that just didn't talk the corporate speak. That made a big difference when it came to dealing with people in different countries. Because everybody was super enthusiastic about music. There was a lot of suspicion about a one-stop shop television channel, which was so powerful. On the other hand, it was highly creative. You know, and there were hundreds of ways in which MTV, which was a bigger star than any of the stars on the channel, you know, in, as a, it had thousands of ways of imaging itself, you know, animations, there was pro-social uh, pieces about, you know, you, know, uh, you know, pollution, about climate change. These were happening in 1987. Where? So a long way ahead. Very conscious of that stuff. It was a very cool environment. And there were cool people that worked there. They, they expected a lot from us, but they allowed me to be myself. They didn't expect me to be a corporate guy, uh, and I, but I suddenly realized I'm now in a position of responsibility and leadership, and I had hundreds at that point in time before it became possibly thousands in the end, but um, hundreds of people who expected me to tell them what, what was going on. And I hadn't any business training, I hadn't had any leadership training except for the chain of command you know, on the studio uh, production work I'd done in my earlier time in New Zealand. So, I realized that I had a responsibility as a leader to be a different kind of leader mm -hmm. and not to be a Harvard MBA type guy. You know, I mean, there were plenty of those guys who did lots of great stuff and kept the business afloat. But actually, 
passion, belief, caring about the music, you know. I, I, remember, I remember the first time we decided, I sat down with a big production group about deciding a playlist and there were 42 songs in an hour that you would play, uh, on a playlist that you'd have per week. So 42 songs would be rotating around. And I always made sure that there were five artists on there who were never necessarily going to be the biggest artists ever, but were cool and probably cooler than MTV and cooler than the artists that, who were the big artists there. So that Madonna and U2 and R.E.M. and those that would feel much better being on a television channel when the cramps were on, <laughs> you know, or I don't know, you know, and, you know, Leonard Cohen, who wasn't a popular artist, he was credible but not popular, he had first we take Manhattan, then we take Berlin. So we played that. So, hey, we were, on, we were in Germany. That's risky, right? That's exactly. amazing. Perfect. It was right on message. So, so suddenly that helped me so much as a leader because people within the organization didn't feel that they were just going to be held to account on discipline and you know, tightness of schedule, but also the opportunity to make a difference. Everybody could get away with something small per day in the office. And I would walk the floor regularly and I would talk to the guy in the post room. I would talk to people and whatever if I was in, you know, Berlin, if I was in, you know, Madrid, if I was in Milano, you know, wherever I was, I would I would walk around and I would talk to people who weren't just people who were reporting to me, but there were people in the organization so they knew that what the personification of the company was like. They knew what I was like. And they knew I wasn't a kind of alpha male type person, but that I had the passion and the belief and probably knew more than they did about popular music. So it wasn't like that people could poo-poo me behind my back because I was living the, you know, I was living the rock and roll lifestyle. I was getting concert tickets all the time I mean, I, and records. I mean, I was, I was up to my neck like Scrooge McDuck and Donald <laughs> Duck diving into his vaults, you know. That, so I was loving it, you know. And I think that made a difference in terms of leadership because I think that it made people feel that I was kind of like one of them, you know, that I had the same ambitions and, 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 and hopes for making a difference. And it wasn't just telling them what to do and how much money they had to make. I mean, that was obviously very important because if the business didn't make a profit, we would have been shut down in five minutes. So, so, so when I took over the organization, I, I said that I would do it. It was obviously, it was an incredible, you know, uh, wonderful thing to be offered. But I said I would only do it if I could bring in my own people underneath me. So I hired a very smart young guy who, as my COO, and he was a business-oriented guy. He'd been to NCAB, which is an international uh, uh, business school, so very you know, internationally focused. Um, didn't just talk in baseball analogies and things like that, and definitely had a much wider premise about it. And I trusted him. And I trusted him that he and I would sink together, rather, or, or float together, but not that, I, that, that I wasn't going to, ever going to take responsibility for what he, you know, what he did right, or if somebody else did something right. I'm, I'm, I always felt that you've got to recognise people's, you know, achievements, and it shouldn't just be in a one-off bonus or in a end of year speech at the office party. It should be they should know that everybody else should recognise that they did that. It didn't make any difference to me. It's still, it's still going to be the boss of the. I didn't have to pretend that I'd done everything that had happened, which you sometimes see. Of course. Out there because people represent it and it becomes me. Whereas it's actually about us. It's always about us. And it also, it, quite often you learnt stuff by walking the floor where people would come up with a, an idea or a solution for something that was an issue that hadn't been thought through by the business analysts or through corporate headquarters who had certain expectations. But sometimes you had to think outside of the box. Sometimes it was the more, most rudimentary and in, you know, I, I guess, you know, natural response that sometimes was worth paying attention to. I mean, you just don't buy it all wholesale. You have to have the acumen to understand that. But if you share that and people felt their contribution could, be, could make a difference, it made a big difference to me because I was not qualified at all apart from being a music fan, you know, which is back to the very basic DNA. You know. Incredible. And if we take a moment just to think, the one word that comes to mind for me that certainly I have felt a lot is imposter syndrome. Yeah. It's stepping into new situations sure. and like, why am I here? How do yeah. I deserve to be here? Did you ever experience uh, any of those feelings? All the time. Right. All the time. Especially if something big, an edict came in from New York 
And you know, I had to get up to speed and even understand what it meant sometimes, you know, because it just was you know, so complicated, usually financing and things like that. So that made it very direct. I, I woke up at three or four in the morning regularly. The, the best example of it is I had to do a big presentation in New York. And I flew in the night before and I was staying at a fantastic hotel, Four Seasons Hotel in New York, jet lagged. I was lying there and I could see the snow coming down. I turned on the TV and I turned on HBO and I watched the Hudsucker Proxy. I don't know whether you've ever seen it. But basically, it, it, it's where a person who runs a business dies and the management decide to put somebody in place to run the business down so a management buyout buy would be at a much lower cost. And, so, and, I, and I just looked at it and I thought, I am that man. <laughs> I am that man who's been sent here to sink the business. <laughs> so so that, that was a pretty, I mean, it was a long, it seemed to be a very long 20 minute walk to, the, to, to 1515 Broadway. <laughs> I love it. And what happened when you got there? Well, I, it all went totally fine, of course. Good. It went fine because, as I said before, the, the great thing about working for a disciplined American company is that they recognize the positive sides of what people could offer. Mm. And they could see the passion of what I was trying to do. And they could see that I had a backing who could talk in much more binary terms than I could do in my flowery, right-brained, you know, creative style. And it, it, yeah, it looked like a package that was worth supporting. Incredible. And they supported me right to the moment when I resigned. You know, they always supported me. And what informed your leadership? Because not everyone in those younger years, in your 30s, not everyone would have that empathy, that understanding to connect with people and think about people. And a lot of young men would be alpha male in their 30s. What informed your leadership? Well, well I had learnt from the early days of starting in television when people were promoted from cameraman or floor manager to junior director, is that insecurity often bred a form of despotism and unpleasant behavior through panic. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that that could never be. And that, because that's an easy default thing, you know, is you pretend you're in charge. Whereas I actually recognize that, that when I was working in the studio, when I started as a junior director, that if you were an inclusive with the people that work with you, they would carry you until you learn, you had to learn the, the, the ropes, but they would carry you until such time as that you could swim by yourself. And that's what informed me. Is I remember people here in Christchurch directing people in the studio and, and the crews that had their back up already you know, and people were looking at their watches and saying, you know, it's a lunch break coming up and things like that. And actually, most of us weren't like that. We were quite enthusiastic. So I recognize that we should, you know, that you can't behave like that as a boss. So that's what informed me. Mm -hmm. and, and then humility, the fact that I actually wasn't a businessman mm -hmm. and I could never pretend, I couldn't bullshit that I was a business guy. You know, that was part of what worked for me was that I was you know, unadulterated in that, in that regard. I never did the speak. Mm -hmm. you know, and so, but that also leaves you vulnerable, but you've got to make sure that you've got backup. And then backup means that you've got to share that responsibility with other people. You know, and then they will, you know, I always felt if you were fighting you know, with your back to the wall in a situation, you know, would they be fighting with you or would they be putting their fingers or folding your arms and saying, let's see him sink. You know, yeah. I thought, I don't want to be. I want to be left. I don't want to be left alone by everybody else. I want them to feel that they're part of my team. Hundred percent. They'll fight with me. So I mean, it's as simple as that. I mean, that sounds might sound a bit rudimentary, but that's how I approached it. And, and and then and then as I said to you, as I hadn't been, you know, a trained business leader through any kind of courses, that you know, I had to be a different kind of leader, and mm -hmm. I had to be a credible leader, and I had to be one of the team. You know, even though I was obviously the boss and obviously was earning more money and you know, I, had got the, you know, I got the business class travel and you know, stayed in the fancy hotels, people knew that, but people wanted that because that was part of their career path as well, of as long as you didn't flaunt it and be remote. How did you build that credibility? You were talking about being a credible leader when people knew you didn't have the business background. Well, Where did I, you... I think it's only down to making sure that everyone recognised that you recognised that you weren't an expert in those things. You had, I had to be able to learn very quickly to ask the silly question that might lead to the right answer. Yeah. Not be afraid. So you can't, no, don't shut up, you've got to venture in, but you don't pretend that you've got the lingo or you've got the, the knowledge. And I just made sure that other, other people were, you know, were promoted to that situation. So it was really a matter of just being, not, not appearing to be insecure mm -hmm. about control. 
It's incredible. I think that is timeless. That can apply across time, that approach. Sort of also lucky, given the circumstances. I mean, you've got to remember that if I've been making widgets mm. and promote, I would, A, I wouldn't have been promoted. If I had been promoted, I would have expected to be a lot more buttoned down than I was. Yeah. But, you know, as a pioneer leading the charge, there's a different set of circumstances required. Of course. And I realised that that was probably the reason why I had a successful career in the international world was that I was a pioneer. And as a pioneer, you were allowed to make mistakes in public. You know, you're, as long as you're honest and you're not arrogant, you know, you can be seen to, within your own organisation to do those things because people see that in themselves. Mm -hmm. That's what most of the people thought. And the creative people felt, hey, there's a creative guy who's running the business. It's not just the business guys who are running the business. There's a creative guy who's making the decisions. And you think yeah. that was bold in terms of MTV back then deciding on that and going that route? You know, I wasn't the only one. Uh, right. I wasn't the only one. People that ran MTV in the US, which was obviously a much bigger business and was a long way ahead of us on the kind of the business curve, that was generally run by creatives mm -hmm. as well. I think that was, there was a guy called Tom Freston who was the chairman of the organization and he was very good at recognizing people who would represent the brand in a credible, positive and, you know, uh, I, you know I guess, you know, real way rather than just, you know, all the, you know, all the people that you're negotiating, negotiating with for advertising sales or for distribution. There's a lot of edgy, you know, you know negotiation, but this was about passion and love and creativity because you know we had a reputation to uphold we were a creative business and as i said before the mtv was as big a star if not a bigger star than mm -hmm. most of the artists so if you can like hold that position uh, and still do business with these people they've got to believe that you're pretty highly creative as well otherwise why would they go to you 100 percent. yeah and in terms of adversity, so like if you led for quite, quite a n number of years, you would have seen some different crises come your way, mm -hmm. maybe uh, geopolitical, financial. What were some of those big moments that you had to traverse? Well, um, well the first thing was anti-Americanism, uh, anti-globalism, you know, imperialism. Uh, there was always the perception that, that was going on because of the, the brand. And that was part of my job was to also make sure that I didn't represent that. I was a sort of a Trojan horse in that regard, I suppose. Yeah. And not just me, but the people around me. So that's one of them. Then in the days before digital, before digital was a word that people talked about, you know, everything was analog. And as the television distribution business grew, it was clear to the operators on satellite and in cable that they needed to place the more blue ribbon brands into a pay tier, so that's how they could start to make the money. That's how television is now. I mean, all those subscription channels that, you're, that we all subscribe to now, you pay for them, right? You don't get them for free. That's right. Right, so, so we was basically put to us that our business would suffer unless we were prepared to put ourselves behind the paywall. Ooh, I didn't like that, because I thought, you know, we, are, we represent young people who, who are watching MTV, which was like a club. You know, suddenly we're telling them they now have to pay for it. How's that going to work? Then I had to sit down with the technical guys and I said, explain to me, this is in the early 90s, what does digital mean? Well, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a different way of coding the signal, you know, um, and it means that you can then encrypt it, so you can make it, so you need a card, in, the, in, the, in this case, in, in your box, in the TV box to be able to access that channel. So it's like, you know, a code to that. So, okay, but what does digital actually do? Well, so one of the things you can do with digital is that you can squeeze the signal. So the analog signal is like this big and you're paying five million a year on seven ch um, satellites around Europe to get one signal out there, one 24 hour channel. Off, so if you, you think that's basically, it, you could actually put seven signals in the place, space of one on one satellite. So suddenly there was f potential for 35 television channels. Wow. And I thought to myself, ooh, because what was happening was, now we've been going for a, a, not, not quite 10 years, but we had a very big and sophisticated business, a huge audience in Germany. You know, not such a big audience in the UK, um, but big in Greece and Italy and different places. So it was, and they were all running at different times. So the market in the UK is a very fast music market. And REM, for, for example, we could be on there, fifth sing signal, uh, single, should I say, 
They, should, they could be on their fifth single. In Germany, they might still be on the first single. Wow. Because they had a different plan and they had... How it was, in France, they may have still been thinking about releasing it. They weren't sure whether it was going to fit into their market or not, an international artist. And in other places, it was, was the music was being bootlegged anyway. So, <laughs> that, you know, there was no control. So I suddenly realised if I took the UK out, or I didn't, it was me and, and my team, if you could take the UK out and let it run at its own speed, let Germany run at its own speed, and then the rest of it would just be Europe, which was what we had been before. And then if any of you who work for the organisation could come to me and say, I can make a business out of this in Scandinavia, or in Holland, or whatever, then I would allow them to schism away from the main, the main uh, you know, network and run their own business. Mm. So there's a lot of potential. And we, we use that model right around the world, uh, and certainly in Latin America and in Asia as well. So that was a big crisis point, because that was a point where if we hadn't encrypted the signal and ran the risk of losing that audience, and the quid pro quo was that the audience suddenly got a market, a, a television fee that was for them in their language, you know, and with the ads that were relevant to them. That, at that point in time, you know, people speaking to you in English as a second language were starting to look a bit kind of, you know, ersatz. Yeah, of course. So the quid pro quo worked, and, but that was a crisis. That, that could have sunk the business. And for you to make the, that decision, because there would have been pressure, there would have been, uh, yeah, people with high expectations. How did you make that decision with high awareness, without rushing it, without... Well, that sort of size decision would never be made unilaterally by even a president of, a, of one of the organizations. You know, the corporate group in New York had a very strong point of view. Yeah. You know, the international group had a very strong point of view. So there was a lot of consensus building. So I had to sell that as a concept. I'm talking to you in analog terms. Because yeah. I see myself as an analog guy, I still play vinyl. I love it. You know, so so uh, you know, I think that's really important to just to, not to forget those things. Yeah. It isn't all about technology, but technology clearly was going to become a tool. Now, I mean, I like it and I didn't like it because I also feel slightly responsible that having turned MTV into a series of MTVs, that we sort of led the way to some of the dross that's now available on the internet and on television, which, you know, frankly, probably doesn't deserve to be up there in the first place. So the risk is that you, once you open the door, then there's always going to be copycats. Who mm. are going to, you know, and I saw us as a blue ribbon, but you know, obviously there's, it's always going to water down, especially with digital, because the proliferation you look at our lives, I mean, how, what, what you and I are using on our phone today and what we'll be doing in, in next year could be so many different things differently. The technology moves so fast. So it was a very complicated decision. And if I'd known how digital was going to go, I would have probably freaked out so much that I maybe wouldn't have pushed, pushed for that. I, I looked at it more simplistically. It seemed to be a practical solution and it seemed a way of moving the business on. But I also see that it was possibly a way of watering it down and making it less potent. And, the, and those people who'd been with us from the beginning watching MTV were no longer seeing the MTV they watched before. Now they were watching just something they might as well be on a local TV channel for mm -hmm. them. So there was a downside. That's the personalization that digital brought actually meant that people lived in their own little cells and they weren't living in, in this international world. I'm an internationalist, you know, and I, I believe in people being like me in other countries. You know, that's, that's how I made a life, and a wonderful life, based upon feeling that those young people in Germany were just like me, mm -hmm. you know, or in France, or in Holland, or in, or in, or in Italy. You know, it's incredible, th rather than thinking, no, you're foreign, you're different, you're other, I actually saw it as accepting that, whereas I think the digital world has made that everybody is other to, to each other. You know, we, own, we live in our own little islands, on our phones, it's a lonely existence in many ways, and a fake existence quite often. Mm -hmm. But in old-fashioned analog terms, you had to still do the broadcast. You had to reach out, and you had to kind of play that game, you know, which I think the shorthand's changed so much now in broadcasting. I bet. But in other ways, it's been great. I mean, look at all the amazing dramas that we can now see. I mean, MTV is nowhere near the potent you know, force that it once was because... Music is just something that people have on their phone now, and they can stream it. They don't even have to own it anymore. Yes, they don't even have to love it. They can just have it as a wallpaper, or what they want other people to see as their wallpaper. Whereas for me, it was like, how big is that stack of 45s? <laughs> <laughs> I was the same. I had CDs and cassette tapes and mini discs when they came out mm. for a short period of time. That. 
Yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah. And so I see you as someone who enjoys connecting with humans and being very human in your approach as a leader. What are you seeing in, say, the business world and in the world in general in terms of the digitization of communication? Well, I see much harder decisions having to be made by people who are running these businesses than I ever had to do. Mm -hmm. The stakes are much higher. Their purchase and ownership of the rest of the world are so much higher than mm -hmm. we ever had. We were just a part of the landscape, not the landscape. Yeah. Um, so I see that, and I see that's really difficult. And I, I see the, the criticism of, you know, is a platform that allows people to put pro um, content up that might actually affect other people in an adverse way. Are you an editor or are you just an enabler mm. that lets people do it? Now, I don't think any of those people entered into that thinking that they would have to make that decision. I think they just thought this was, I'm giving people access. But suddenly now we're treating these guys as editors mm -hmm. or should be editors or whatever. So I think that I think that's a big responsibility. And, and frankly, they, the, you know, the the big platforms, that, the distribution platforms, have got a lot of responsibility. And you know, between governments and those broadcasters, I think you know we need to make some really grown-up decisions here. And it isn't just about power. I mean, I don't, I'd hate to think this is becoming the new middle, you know, middle ages and feudal society. You know, there is there is the fabric of society which has got to be controlled by democracy, and you know, people should be protected to a degree. I and mean, you know, it isn't a nanny thing. It's like you've got to have, a, you know, you've got to have something which is truly representing the, the state, or the country, or you know, people's lives. It can't just be somebody who's making more money, deferring a decision. That's r really tricky. So I think it's very hard for these guys. It's but they're now put in a situation where it, the stakes are so high, and the numbers would change so radically. You look how quickly the stock price can go for Apple, you know, you know, uh, Meta, or you know, all these people. You know, it's it just changes like daily by by have a you know you sneeze once and stock price falls. That's right. It's tricky, so the stakes are high, and you know it, I never had to deal with anything, even in my lower relatively lowly level, never had to deal with those sort of ramifications. The biggest ramification I normally had to deal with was losing my job. Mm -hmm. When you reflect back, what are you most proud of in your career as a leader? Hmm. Well, I think that people enjoyed working for me. You know, I think it probably, I, I like to believe that anyway. I might be deluding myself. I'm sort of proud of that. I'm proud of that, that I felt that I'm probably one of those people that probably people will look back in their, in their early career and thought there was somebody that it's not like what I'm dealing with now. Yeah. You know, I certainly don't think I'm anything like any of the people who are running these businesses now, and neither would I get that job anymore, because it, you just wouldn't. So I think I was lucky that things were much simpler and more passionate and that I but I, I felt that I took the chance to move out of teaching and go into television and the chance to work for MTV two jobs in my life Incredible. I'm pretty proud of only ever having two jobs I'm not an entrepreneur I don't try to pretend that I'm, I've got you know the gift of making money I don't feel like any of those things at all I think I had you know I had to use a system without exploiting other people to make a life for myself, and I, I feel good that I don't I don't feel any guilt about that. You know, I feel bad about having to. I certainly had to fire people, and I had to make people redundant. But I held the erosion. I was like the gorse bushes on the hill. I kind of held on to that as long as possible. I didn't run headlong into making sure my bonuses got paid by firing somebody in Singapore. So I think you know, and I felt that the organisation, interestingly, Viacom that I worked for and MTV were generous. And they were positive. They had great human res you know, resources divisions, you know, and you know that that enabled me because I felt that the system wasn't evil inherently, uh, and that people cared. You know, and that when people were made redundant, they they were generous with that. You know, um, they they definitely, you know, there was a lot of criticism about MTV and big corporates, but they were they were good good people, and and you know women were very prominent in that organisation. You know, and made you know for the better, made made the business better. You know, it was a for, forward-thinking uh, organisation. Was you know proactive in that regard. Mm, sounds like it. Mm. And you talk about that that feeling of hey, I think people genuinely enjoyed working with me and for me. So for the listener that's listening now that leads a team 
yeah. or is going to be leading a yeah. team, what advice would you give them around making sure that they look after their people so the chances are when yeah. the people finish, they'd say, he was a good leader, she was well, a good leader. I think, firstly, don't be insecure and mm -hmm. don't turn that insecurity into despotism for the sake of looking like you're in control. You know, I think most important is you've got to recognise that those people are just like you, without the opportunity you've had. Mm. Yeah, you know, and be humble about that, uh, because I think that's that's absolutely crucial in terms of being a, a you know a, a humane boss in a big organisation. So, I think that's most mostly it. I mean, because I feel that you know success has has been bound quite regularly around how much money somebody earns. And everybody looks at that and goes, that's what I want to be. I want to be the guy that's earning you know, 25 million a year. But actually, that's not leadership. That's helping yourself. Mm -hmm. Leadership is helping each of those individual people to see the potential of a path, if they've got it within them, to make that money. You know, you, if you can't look like you're helping those people, then you're basically just a placeholder until the next placeholder comes along. So that, I think, is important. Just think about other people and that never feel arrogant about your success being making you a better person because we're all better than everybody else on at some things but i guarantee you that none of us are better than everybody else at everything 100 percent. that's beautifully said i want to think about towards the end of your time leading mtv mm -hmm. how did you know you were getting towards the end of your time yeah well if you haven't learned it already you know i'm a music fan i i, I love music you know, I absolutely love it. I love music in all sorts of forms. And MTV, the M stands for music. Mm. And to be fair, towards the end, as digital started to grow, the internet started to happen, people started stealing music online because you could, without paying for it. You know, music was, became a devalued part of the brand. And it was obviously important. And you know, MTV America being further ahead in the, in the cycle, had moved into short form and then long form programming mm. to own intellectual property, which is the game now. Um, and I wanted to stick with music. I thought that we could ride out any fights we might have with labels about rights holders because in the end, we marketed music better than anybody does themselves off, off their own label website or, or whatever. You know, it's, it, it, you know, I thought that we actually pumped life into stuff and that's that's what i believe what the, our brand did so i thought we could write it out because i thought in the end people would see that mtv was still the natural marketing partnership but i saw the writing on the wall that's not the way the company was going to go because in the end you've still got you know, you know ebitda goals to hit mm. you know you've got you know people's bonuses are reflected on you know profit margin and that usually means squeezing people and getting people out you know liquidizing cash you know, and that, that sort of thing. And I just didn't want to be part of that. I didn't want to be part of a fire, hiring and firing thing. It didn't, you know, it, it might or might not have happened after me or during my time, but I just didn't want to do that anymore. And my goal was that I wanted to be able to stop work at 50 and not to have to work again. I'm not fantastically rich, but I'm not working. You know, I give my time pro bono or have done. Um, I just thought, I'm going to get out with my head held high. I'm going to get out and basically say, I don't believe in the direction we were going anymore, you know, and I'm, I'm leaving. Which unfortunately did cause a, you know, in my organisation, did cause a, a lot of people to, to leave because they were no longer protected by that kind of organisation. So I realised that it was a selfish decision on my behalf, but it was for self-preservation. Yeah, and you could say that's selfless in, in some respects to look after your own. In some ways, but, but you know, there are other people who, without me, were going to be seen as part of the old regime. Mm. That's always the way. Yeah, that's always the way. But I mean, I felt responsible for it. Yeah, and in terms of values, like when I hear you speak, the fact that you decided to step down because of those reasons that would bring it back to your values-led yeah. leadership. How much is enough? Yeah. How much is enough? You know, I'm, I'm sick of people, you know, talking about the price of their property or how much money they made on this deal, things like that. I, I, I don't care about that. You know, I mean. Are you a decent human being? Mm. You know, can you look at yourself in the mirror and think you're an okay person? You know, I think that's what I wanted to do. I just didn't want to look myself in the mirror and think, you know, you're just a guy who used to be pretty good at managing people and now you're pretty good at firing people. Mm. I don't know whether it would have got to that, but I saw that was where I was headed. And I think it, you know, I'd done my dash. You know, it was, you know, I'd had 20, 20 good years there. That's great. And I'd made a difference. I'd been a pioneer. 
what more can you ask for, really? I mean, you know, so I got out. I love it. And in terms of your time there, was there an artist or a band or someone that really stood out that you thought they, they represent why I love music so much? Oh, yes. Uh, the first time I was telling about that music playlist, the 42 song playlist, and those five artists that were in there, my first playlist that I had control of, I put the Cramps on, a band called the Cramps, psychobilly band, crazy belie true believers and kind of you know crazy fucked up rock and roll. <laughs> and you know, I put them on, I put Bikini Girls with Machine Guns on high rotation next to U2 and next to Madonna, <laughs> and I thought, yes. <laughs> that's epic. I love it. And that's amazing that you had that ability to do that. And also the appetite for a risk there, because there could have been a lot of pushback. Well, but hell, every week is a new playlist. You can easily drop an artist over there. It's not, not the end of the world, you know. I mean, it's not that risky, you know. So I just thought, thought it was, it made us look better. Yeah. You know, it just made us look better. And I love the craps. You know, I just thought they were, they, they, that's my idea of rock and roll, you know. And Amazing. I, yeah, it's not the mainstream world. They're never going to be a high rotation on any radio station. But, you know, and they were on MTV in America as well, to be fair. So, and they would play that stuff. You know, and, we've, and we found because of that sort of music had a, an audience, that we could have 120 minutes, you know, which was a you know, two hour show, obviously, which was sort of indie, alternative, edgy, you know, and we, it was sort of seen as a specialist show. Mm -hmm. and it wasn't just about you know, high rotation top 20 music. And I love the fact that you're clear on vision. That's one thing that keeps coming up as we chat. You were, as a youngster, you were clear, I want to be in the music industry, and that's where I want to have my career. Then at the end, you're like, I want to be done by 50. Yeah. And again, when I talk to great leaders, they always come back to being clear on where they're headed and what they want. Yeah. So you got what you wanted. What happened post that? When you stepped away from MTV, what did life look like for you then? Well, it was tough. Yeah. It was tough. It was tough. I mean, you know, I, I would have been prisoned with this big, you know, international group and suddenly I was nobody. Mm -hmm. You know, no, long, no more free tickets, no more free CDs, you know. Um, Nobody returning your phone call anymore, you know, that sort of thing. That was, it was a bit of that. But I felt liberated. I felt that I had hit my game plan, you know, and I was made, offered the opportunity pro bono, certainly, but to be a governor of the South Bank Centre in, in the UK. Wow. And that came up pretty quickly. And the South Bank Centre is the largest publicly funded uh, arts organisation in the UK. It has the Royal Festival Hall, all the great orchestras in the world play there. Most of the great artists have played there at some stage when they're, if they're not already in arenas. Um, and I gave my time for free. For 12 years I did that and I supported, you know, the, the thing called the Meltdown, which was every year a contemporary popular artist, Yoko Ono, David Bowie, David Byrne, you know, Ornette Coleman, you know, MIA, all these interesting people. There'd be like a festival that we'd put on. So I just lived for that. And so it was okay. fantastic. So, so I did that and I, and I felt I felt good about that, you know, I, I felt that I could offer something, but, but I was no longer an executive. I, was, I mean, I could try to influence people as much as possible, but you've also got to remember as a board member that you, you're not the one making those decisions. You're actually guiding and governing, governance point of view, but you weren't making those things. And I, I sometimes would, would like to be able to make that decision to put someone I thought would be better on, mm -hmm. or don't put that person as a, as a curator of that particular festival. Someone better would be, you know, in my mind, would be better. I found that difficult because I was used to having that power. How did you hold back? Well, you have to. That's what you do. That's the that's the role of governance. Is that you know you've got to know where the where those walls are. You know? Not everyone does. <laughs> no, no, that's true. But I mean, they don't have to answer to you. Yeah. You know? And it's public. Yeah, you know, it's a public service organisation. They've got all the rights in the world to say thanks. We hear what you're saying, but we're not going to do that. And you can fire us if you don't like it. But mm -hmm. but. So yeah, it was good for me. I, I didn't mind, and, and it meant that I got to be around my kids, you know, teenage lives, you know, and I could go to a lot more gigs. I only had to go to any of the gigs I ever wanted to go to. I never had to go to gigs just to shake hands with an artist or give them a gold disc or be given a gold disc. I didn't have to do that anymore. And I hated all that stuff. You know, I, I was never, I never wanted to hang out with pop stars. No, I met plenty of great artists, but. I didn't want to hang out with rock, but they didn't care about me. They cared about what I could help them with, of course. But pretty soon, as soon as I left, I was nobody. I've tried a couple of times to, you know, offer something to somebody, say, hey, would you mind talking to this young person or something like that? No reply, no, no return. That speaks what, of their values, that's, right? That's, yeah, that's, well, that's true, but I mean, I didn't have that 
didn't have that kind of juice anymore. But mm -hmm. but that was okay. I didn't care. I mean, that, I knew that it was going to come. I mean, you have to be big enough to know that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I didn't want to be another middle-aged guy, this powerful job, having to claw his way back into another powerful job. I just thought, I don't want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I just want to be a good guy, you know? I just want to be me. I love that. So Brent, just chatting about your kids, how do you feel that your career impacted on them or helped shape the dad you were for them? Well, hmm, it's a really interesting question. I think good and bad. Um, I think um, I gave them expectations that life was going to be one way <laughs> until I was no longer doing that job. So I guess that was probably a bit of a body blow for them. Mm -hmm. um, I think. They both have a real passion for music and, and creativity and uh, art and arty stuff. So my son is in a band. You cool. Know, um, Let's give him a shout out. What's the band? Uh, well, he, he's a drummer in, a, in a, a woman called Naima Bok in her band. They're on Sub Pop, which is a very large American um, uh, indie label. Signed Nirvana and people like that. Wow. So he's just uh, you know starting out there, but I mean you know he's got really good taste in music and I hope that I might have helped guide some of that, you know. Uh, our daughter works in the creative world, she works for um, Ridley Scott Associates, so in the commercial world, so, um, you know, she's got, you know, she's got a lot of discipline and skills, so I think that they, I, I gave them an expectation that probably that you could make a, li a life in either music or from the visual arts um, and business. And of course, that's, those are businesses that don't pay anywhere near as well as they did in my day. Yeah. And I think that probably might be a little bit sobering for them. Um, I think probably I didn't spend enough time with them when I was young because I was always on an aeroplane somewhere. Although I would get up at four in the morning to go to a meeting in Oslo rather than stay the night before in a hotel so I could go to bed and say goodnight to them the night before. But I kind of feel that probably they missed out on you know, probably when I was younger and had more enth more energy and enthusiasm for life. Um, by the time I left, they were ready to move on themselves. So I don't know. I, um, I think that I'm a double-edged sword for them. You know, uh, Pip, my wife, is a very consistent, you know, nurturing person. So she's been the sort of the backbone of the family, really. Uh, I'd like to have had to spend a bit more time with that. But I think I gave them a love for, you know, creativity and, and the arts. So um, I hope that's been good. But you know, to reach the level that I did, we pretty hard, and I think that the reality of that's biting. You know, it's not, it's not a, it's not succession. I'm not mm -hmm. handing on the business. You know, yeah, I didn't own anything, so that's tough. I think. Mm -hmm. you know. But they're both great, great people, and you know, I respect their taste and their point of view. So they're not, they're not people I wouldn't spend time with, if, even if they weren't related to me. <laughs> I love it. And I think it's important, people who operate at a high level and people who I've interviewed, whether they're athletes or they're running countries, they all talk about that challenge when you're a parent and you're at the top of your game professionally yeah. around trying to balance the time and not feel the guilt or the regret. Yeah. But at the end of the day, there's got to be an imbalance somewhere to, to perform. Yes. But also, there's been studies that shown that when a child, a young child, can see a parent who's got a glint in their eye, a yeah. passion, yeah. and are driven for it, it yeah. can set them up for a life of purpose and a life of meaning. Yeah, but I think that, you know, just seeing a cynical parent who is actually not there that often would be a terrible situation. Totally. Um, you know, there's a lot of expectation on, on um, people who lead businesses to live that business 24 hours a day. So it's a brave person who can actually take time out. But mm -hmm. I wouldn't take calls at night, you know. I wouldn't. Uh, I just would would read them in the morning. I you know read, need, read the messages in the morning. I wouldn't do that. I would because I was home. I was home. So unless there was a disaster, or something went down, um, I was not contactable. It's brilliant. So I think, and I think that you know, that there's always somebody who wants to be responsible, and somebody who'd probably prefer to come up with a solution, and probably closer to the where the problem is, they're probably the people who have got the solution more than someone at the top who's just going to shout and scream. Hundred percent. And I like that you had that boundaries. I think because things have changed so much with email and text and FaceTime, a lot of leaders are literally available 18, 19 hours a day. Yeah. And they're sleeping for a short window, but the phone still stays on. Yeah. And I think there's a danger there. Well, definitely there's a danger. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember many years ago, a guy coming into my office and saying to me, there's this thing that's going to happen that's going to be called email. And it's incredible. And what you do is you go to your hotel room and you take this briefcase you take the phone off the hook, you put this sucker pad on the listening button, you put this sucker pad on the 
on the on this talking bit, and you dial a number and it sucks your messages in. And I just remember looking at the guy saying, "Why would I want that? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I want to be out from there. I need to be focusing on the job at hand. I don't want to be distracted by that. Oh, believe you me, it'll be make a big deal, a big difference. I'm, okay, so I, I didn't call that one right. And then the other thing we had this television system called Basis which is uh, software and a computer, which you could put uh, write script and it would count the word, it was the word count and told you how many seconds it would take to read it. Then you could put a video tape insert in it and you put it inwards and outwards and it would add the whole thing up as an item. And then you could drag that, the slug line up and down. So that's how news bulletins operate. So if a, if a news story comes in, you can just move it up the queue. You used to have to type it all out on a piece of paper. So, but so that, that's by the by, but the, what actually happened was there was a, an opportunity in that system for you to send a message to other people. So, hey, can you, is, are, you, are you ready with the script yet? And almost immediately that system came in, uh, passive aggressive, bitchy behavior happened. Mm. And that's what happens now, right? It's, how often does that happen online, on the phone, misunderstandings, curtness, you know, capital letters being you know, mistaken for shouting, you know, just little things like that. So I re realized that there was another part of human behavior. Mm -hmm. One was that my life could be 24 hours a day in my work. And my other one was this could actually end up to really bad behavior. And that's, that one has been borne out. I mean, oh, you know, massively. Incredible. And so for the, the current leader, what would your advice be then when there's an important message that needs to be relayed to an individual? And you call them. You pick up the phone and you call them. Yeah. You don't send it as a message that, yeah, if it's that important that the boss is calling you, then you pick up the phone. Because then they can hear the tonality. They... Yeah, yeah. Well, it's important. Otherwise, it's just you know, you know, there are people that send twenty-five emails at four in the morning because they can't sleep. Well, that's just that's just I mean. Hopefully, people aren't seeing that. But if you're worried about your boss, and that phone's dinging through the night, you're waking up. A hundred percent. And that's not going to help anybody's life. Not at all. Now, Brent, let's chat about what's happening right now. So. You and I have met a few times in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, the World Championships to be mm -hmm. specific, and then we've caught up here in Christchurch a few times. So what brings you back to, to Christchurch? I know it was your hometown, but what brings you back? Family. Yeah. yeah. Family. My mother is still alive and you know she lives in the family home. I come back to see her. Uh, my wife and I have a house here in New Zealand, so we spend a couple of months there in Auckland, where we, the weather is usually good. <laughs> this year was slightly different. Uh, Weather's usually really good, but you know, and all my family's here. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I know this is going to sound terrible, but I'm a, I'm a man of the world, you know, and I, I like to, I like living in London. You know, mm -hmm. I've lived more than half my life in London. I was growing up, and you, know, you can't take the Christchurch out of me, but I'm, a, I'm a Londoner, you know, and that's what, that's what, you know, that's my, my heartbeat. You know, mm -hmm. I think New Zealand's nicer, much better lifestyle. Some incredibly incredible people here. I think if I lived here, it would be totally fine. But I'm so used to the London beat, even though it's, you know, Brexit mad, you know, so small-minded Britain, little Britain, all those things are going on. It's still an international hub of creativity. It's still a place where the best gigs are on. You know, most of the mostly exciting stuff happens in my arty, farty, non non-working world. Mm -hmm. Meets all your needs, right? Yeah. And it's interesting because I think of that, I'm from Northern Ireland, but I think Christchurch is home and I'm a Kiwi now. So it's yeah. funny that we've both found our place. Of course. But just 12,000 miles from our homes. Yeah. Yeah. But you had something different because of that background. And probably part of your enthusiasm and your focus is because you've come here with another point of view. And you're not just, you're not just grown up with it, but you've actually seen what's good about it. Mm -hmm. 100%. I'm just so grateful that you do keep coming back and that we get to have these great conversations. Cool. And hopefully that'll happen for many more years. Excellent. I've got one last question for you, sure. if you don't mind. So if we were to fast forward way into the future, many years into the future, and you know that it's your last day on earth, and a very young person, dear to you, maybe six, seven years old, comes up and asks you, Brent, how can I lead my life on purpose? What would you share with them? Well, I think it's just never, never lose sight of the person that you are as, as a six or seven year old person. I mean, just never forget what that person is. You know, the things you don't know and the things you do know. And always be humble about the things that you don't know. And never try to tell people how to live their life because you think you know better than they do. You know, you lead by example, but you don't tell people what to do. 
for the sake of it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Brent, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to connect. Till next time. Cheers. Thank you. Very good. That was amazing. Hey guys, if you enjoyed the content today, please smash that subscribe button below. And if you want to become part of my community, I've got an amazing free Facebook group. Please come and join us. The link is in the description below. And also, if you've got any questions about today's session, I'd love to know. Just comment below and I'll be sure to get back to you guys. Have the most amazing day.